Tibet, the roof of our world. Words do no justice to the untouched beauty of this far corner of Earth. A vast, mysterious, and sacred place, embraced and protected by miles of immovable mountains. Monasteries, built many hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ago, stand in defiance of the elements, precariously placed among the clouds. Many of these very ancient structures are said to have been built on the remnants of once even grander ancient buildings, structures many religions attribute to the gods. Among the seemingly endless mountain ranges lay one mountain which is different, one which is special. It is believed by most of Tibet, and even further afield, that the god Shiva lay buried within this sacred mountain. According to ancient beliefs, this enigmatic Tibetan mountain represents the axis of the world, the stairway to heaven. In many eastern countries, Mount Kailash is considered the holiest place on earth. Some ancient sources even suggesting it is where one could find the mysterious city of the gods. It is indeed regarded within the climbing world as unascendable. A route has never been located and probably never will. Few have been brave enough to even go near this place in the past century. There may be some profound reasoning behind these ancient clusters of human beings, regarding this particular mountain over all others as sacred and as the resting place of a god. There may, however, be ulterior motives at play when it comes to the discouragement of climbers in attempting the peak. A team of Russian scientists, intrigued by the history and a possible suppression of its true nature, have suggested after covert explorations that the top of Mount Kailash is not a natural formation. It is actually the remnants of a giant man-made pyramid of great antiquity. Just how old this pyramid could be currently remains unclear. What also remains unclear is if the entire mountain is a man-made pyramid, disguised by the erosion of many millennia. The research team claimed, quote, The stratum is horizontal with the layers of stone slightly varying in color. The dividing lines show up clear and distinct, which gives the entire mountain the facade of having been built by giant hands of huge blocks of reddish stone." End quote. A mysterious claim put forward in regards to the mountain concerns rapid aging when in the area. After spending 12 hours in the region, the length of nails and hair was equal to two weeks of normal growth in some cases. Several mystics have said that the mountain has a secret entrance within it, leading to the legendary kingdom of Shambhala. Legend also states that when the ice on its peak finally melts, it will reveal the eye. Professor Ernst Muldashev, PhD, a doctor and explorer who traveled to Tibet extensively, said later in his life, quote, There are two underground countries, the Shambhala and Agartha which are each part of the gene pool of humanity and civilization. Information provided by the Thule Society shows there is a higher civilization coming from the Himalayas and divided into two branches, the Shambhala and Agartha, the former being the center of power protected by unknown forces and energy." End quote. An understanding of what sort of pyramid Kailash could be, or indeed just how special it is, may take several years to establish. I will, of course, keep you posted. Fort Ransom is a small place within the state of North Dakota, USA, that may hold an enormous yet quietly held secret. In this small slice of the rural farming lands of the United States lies a place known as Pyramid Hill, a small, modest pyramidal mound which is very similar in shape and size to the curious pyramidal mound found in other parts of the world, such as Silbury Hill, a chalk pyramid within the UK. Long argued by a number of funded geologists as a mere natural formation, however, local residents, along with historical accounts within the area, have strongly disagreed with these conclusions, since their predictable acceptance by the academic community. A vast portion of the surrounding population believe, including a number of specialist historians and archaeologists, that Pyramid Hill is in fact that of a man-made pyramid, 
What's more, they hold to the belief that it is the oldest pyramidal structure on Earth. What makes this site the most interesting, we feel, however, and the reason for this video, is the writing stone which was found nearby some centuries ago. Clearly very ancient cup and ring marks, and constructed to form some kind of communication. They have, however, remained undeciphered. They are incredibly intriguing, and are reminiscent of a hybrid between music and Morse code. Yet all attempts to establish a translation of the pattern have been unsuccessful. Located in the Cheyenne River Valley, in southeastern North Dakota, pitted mysteriously cup and ring marked boulders appear in Saskatchewan, South Dakota, Iowa, and many other sites all over the world. Just who created them remains a mystery. Was the writing stone left by the original builders of Pyramid Hill? If so, why is it an unknown language? Who wrote it? Is Pyramid Hill really the oldest pyramid on Earth? Built by an unknown culture who clearly spoke and wrote a highly complex and as yet undecipherable language? Perhaps one day we will find out the truth. We recently covered the so-called Inca Road, an ancient stone pathway that stretches an astonishing 25,000 miles across Peru, Chile, and far beyond. Linking countless ancient, as yet unexplained ruins, this enormous ancient road was carved straight through solid cliff faces, along near vertical rock faces, and is an astonishing example of ancient architecture. Although currently claimed as being Incan, and conveniently often overlooked by mainstream academic study, along with the sites it connects, it is clearly an example of building capability far out of the reach of Incan civilization. The Huaca del Sul, an adobe brick temple, that regardless of the clear feet of its construction, along with the currently recognized number of builders involved, is regardless of these facts, still stubbornly claimed as having been built by the so-called Mochi civilization between 100 CE to 800 CE. Located upon the northern coast of Peru, the temple is one of several ruins found near the volcanic peak of Cerro Blanco. The other major ruin at the site is the nearby Huaca de la Luna, a better preserved but smaller temple. According to academic opinion, by 450 CE, eight different stages of construction had been completed on the Huaca del Sul. The technique was additive. New layers of bricks were laid directly on top of the old, hence large quantities of bricks were required for the construction. Archaeologists have estimated that the Huaca del Sul was composed of over 130 million adobe bricks, and was the largest pre-Columbian adobe structure built in the Americas. The number of different maker's marks on the bricks suggests that over a hundred different communities contributed to the construction of the Huacas, yet regardless of the clearly astonishing ancient feat that this structure was, largely attributed to be the remains of an ancient pyramid. The facts surrounding the past true purpose of this structure is merely ignored in favor of an attribution to a more modern ancestor. For if it is indeed noted as being that of an ancient pyramid, like many alternative, independent, and often nicknamed fringe researchers have, it would open the door to some controversial questions. One in particular being why would a civilization located at the claimed time within history build pyramids? Just like those upon the African continent, namely upon the Giza Plateau. Why would a culture that had supposedly never met ancient Egyptians, just like those ruins found all over Guatemala, and indeed South America, have built these enigmatic structures purely by coincidence? It seems that the evidence has mounted over the years, in opposition to such opinion, and these ancient ruins are simply improbable to have merely come about by chance or coincidence, and were indeed once built with full intentions that are now lost to the eons. Who built the Huaca del Sul? Why did they build it? It is undoubtedly an astonishing ancient ruin, 
one which we find highly compelling. In 1917, an amazing find was made in Indonesia. Entered into the report of the Department of Antiquities, the Dutch historian N.J. Chrome also mentioned it in 1949. Employees of the National Archaeology Research Center visited the site in 1979 for a study of its archaeology, history, and geology. If the claims are proven accurate, Indonesia possesses the oldest pyramidic structure on the face of the earth. Buried under a mound of ancient sediment. Located around 800 meters above sea level, the site covers a hill in a series of terraces bordered by retaining walls of stone, and is covered with massive rectangular stones of volcanic origin. The Sundanese people considered the site sacred, believing it was the result of the legend of King Siluwangi's attempts to build a palace in one night. Based on various dating techniques, the site has an official dating for completion by 5000 BC and quite likely much earlier. This pyramid is very old indeed. Interestingly the Lakan mountain in Borneo or rather, what the natives and tourists alike have known as a mountain for millennia, has also recently been confirmed to actually be an ancient pyramid. Drill samples from the tops of these mounds have provided carbon dates going as far back as 20,000 BC, the deeper they drilled the older the carbon dates became, peaking out at a layer of not local basalt at 90 feet. In West Java ancient knowledge had successfully been retained, indigenous communities claimed Egyptians landed, and even colonized Indonesia well before 2000 BC. The evidence for the colonization of Indonesia by the ancient Egyptians, is documented by Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles, in his volume, The History of Javam, 1830. Tomb paintings and writings show that the Egyptians were trading down the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. Were these structures actually created by Egyptians? Why were they placed where they lay? As I have mentioned before we know an awful lot about the Egyptian civilization, a lot of our knowledge from what they left us in written language, scrawled and hieroglyph all over these ancient monuments, we know about mummification processes in detail, we know all about their religious rituals, death practices etc, yet, alas, not one shred of writing on how they constructed such awe-inspiring tombs, or why make them in the shape of a pyramid, out of millions of tons of accurately placed stone. Did the Egyptians just claim these structures as their own, as an illusionary appearance of power? A drought killed the ancient Egyptians, yet their supposed sphinxes show evidence of submersion, and thousands of years of heavy rainfall, this points a logical finger at an earlier creation date. With modern technologies, testing equipment, penetrating radar, and the internet, it appears the truth of who we really are, and who our ancestors were, may be revealed to us all. In 1914, archaeologists found an astonishing location in Ganung Padang, in Indonesia. Two ancient stone mountains rest in this region, mountains in the form of pyramids, their size is truly massive. Intrigued by their shape, this 1914 team initiated a series of test digs in the small likelihood that they were man-made. The proposition of these two huge land features actually being pyramids, must have been virtually unthinkable to these initial explorers, their subsequent excavation also concluded that the site was indeed a natural formation. However, fast forward 100 years of technological advances in archaeology, photography, ground penetrating radar and satellite imaging, and we can now take much deeper looks at locations, gaining far greater insight than was possible a century ago. The archaeological societies are currently in a panic, in regards to an expedition which is being undertaken to this very site. Over 100 years after its initial discovery and disregardment. What is interesting to note, a detail this team must be aware of, a detail largely suppressed and rarely discussed, is the fact that very ancient monuments rest upon the tops of each mountain, monuments that were later dated at 2500 years old. And confirmed as artificial megalithic structures. The reason the archaeological community is worrying, is due to their possible size. They would dwarf the Great Pyramids of Giza. However, the pyramids, in Giza are in a very special location, they in fact rest on the center of the world's land mass, the question would be, why would Indonesia possess such ginormous pyramids? In 2010, geologist Dr. Daninata Wijaja, who earned a doctorate at Caltech, recognized the mountains as possible man-made pyramids, and began to explore using ground-penetrating radar, seismic tomography, resistivity survey and other remote sensing techniques, as well as some direct excavations and deep core drilling. The results were immediately intriguing 
producing evidence of deeply buried man-made chambers and yielding carbon dates going back as far as 26,000 years. This would make the construction prior to the last ice age. Such ideas are heresy to mainstream archaeologists. The archaeological establishment in Indonesia banded together against Dr. Nato Wijaja and his team, lobbied the political authorities, agitated locally and succeeded in slowing down, though not completely stopping, the further exploration of Ganung Padang. However Dr. Nato Wijaja fought back, doing some high-level lobbying of his own, taking the matter to the president of Indonesia himself. There were further delays to do with elections in Indonesia but just a couple of months ago, the final obstacles were lifted and Dr. Nato Wijaga and his team moved back on to the Ganung Padang site with full approval to go ahead with their work, including permission to excavate the concealed chambers. Although it may not be widely received, this excavation may be the most important currently being undertaken on Earth. Mainstream archaeologists are furious, and have been lobbying to get the work stopped, fortunately to no avail. Preliminary excavations have produced results that prove beyond doubt that Ganung Padang is indeed a man-made pyramid of great antiquity. Even the relatively young layer so far excavated, the second artificial columnar rock layer beneath the megalithic site visible on the surface, has yielded dates of 5200 BC, nearly 3000 years older than the orthodox dating for the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. They are also firm indications from the original remote sensing and core drilling work that there is much older layers below. In short, it is now evident to all that the site is vastly older than the 2,500 years archaeologists had insisted upon for decades. Even the most hostile are now quietly reframing their assessment of the site and referring to it as a gigantic terrace tomb, which was part of the biggest megalithic culture in the archipelago. I will keep you posted. There are a considerable number of ancient anomalies located within Egypt. These ancient feats of engineering litter sites and the quarries the stones were sourced and shaped at. And although many of you would have heard of Aswan Quarry, Elephantine may be a less familiar location to you, and for good reason. Not only are the pyramids one of the most perplexing, near perfectly constructed, and as yet unexplained ancient architectural accomplishments on Earth, but how an ancient civilization supposedly placed within permitted known archaeological history, accomplished such a feat, or indeed why? What was their original purpose? Academic contradiction, a severe lack of anomalous artifacts explored, never mentioned or somehow conveniently go unnoticed. However, in the real world, beyond the boundaries of the fenced or so-called schools of education, Thanks to our own work and the presentation of such a volume of inexplicable events artifacts, ruins or megaliths, along with many others allied within similar fields, independently funded researchers, investigative agents, and many more sometimes even noticed first by a viewer credited with its rediscovery within our coverage. Thanks to all this movement working to expose such enigmas, has meant that not only are these incredible characteristics now being documented, mentioned, popularized, photographed and studied more and more each day, now being recognized by more and more critically thinking individuals individually finding evidence of lost technologies that had until then either been undiscovered or deliberately overlooked by the funded academic. The vast catalog of unexplained architecture, again growing by the day, but also the often accompanying curious stone cuts, scars, and striations, all clearly left by high-speed disc-cutting machine, a signature tool mark, identical to that which is left by modern-day power tools, along with the still absent demonstration of the methods used to construct the pyramids, leads anyone to this ongoing and seemingly most controversial of arguments regarding the origins of the ruins found across Egypt. The Colossus of Memnon, each one weighing far over 1,000 tons, would sing every morning an amazing ability we have covered in a previous video, a curious characteristic reported all the way up until the Roman era. We also covered the thick layer of sea salt once found coating the pyramid's ground and underground caverns, along with a water line reported at around 40 meters up their sides still visible during the Spanish invasion. This clearly suggests that the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx are in reality so old 
they even had once been submerged in ocean waters. An ancient ocean, which over the eons has shifted, leaving behind sediment in the form of the desert sands. There are many enormous ancient megalithic stones hidden in and around the three great pyramids of Egypt. Not only are there enormous ancient stones virtually hidden in plain sight, thus although walked across, largely overlooked, hardly ever mentioned, and never explained in regards to their transport and placement, as modern academia will never be able to provide a logical, sound explanation for these feats. The casing stones, an area of interest we have explored and documented, not only displayed vastly different ages, but also construction methods and types of stones sourced and used. Ultimately, undeniable proof of efforts to preserve the outer stones of these incredible ancient pyramids later on within their history. Signature tool marks, unique features such as protuberances, masonry shapes, polygonal stone walling, and many other features which we have discovered during our explanations into the relics of lost antiquity. Yet Egypt's most intriguing assets, and we feel the most baffling relics which all alternative historians should have within their debacle armory, are undoubtedly to be found within the once abruptly abandoned quarries. The unfinished obelisk found at Aswan, being one such relic, the most well-known of these incredible stones by a long way. Not only is the obelisk over 1,000 tons, but also due to the identifiable scoop-like tool marks left upon its granite sides. A signature scarring, which again, we have so far found, explored and shared this marking at many other ancient sites around the world. Who were the original builders of the Great Pyramids? Were they the same group that quarries Aswan? What tools did these people use to cut many of the relics still left at the Elephantine Island Quarry? How can anyone gaze upon such precision stonework and not ponder? How did he accomplish such an incredible finish with such hard stone, with such soft chisels and those made of copper? Not only do we find the currently attested tale of events vastly incomplete, but in many ways virtually impossible. Predictably, we are often confronted with an illogical explanation as to the origins of many unexplainable ruins. Yet Egypt, in particular Aswan and Giza, were clearly the work of a group capable of working and building with 1,000 ton plus stones. With columns of pink Aswan granite, weighing over 14 tons each, over 10,000 kilometers to Baalbek. Is this connection mere coincidence? Or are the builders of said sites connected somehow? Possibly one and the same? Questions we get closer to answering every day. We find it highly compelling. Neolithic man is often talked of as if he were a very different being to that of the modern man. Throughout the modern era, a well-funded, close-knit, often aristocratic academia has portrayed Neolithic man as an illiterate figure, often leopard print toga-wearing, club-wielding, bearded nincompoop, a grubby, forceful, filthy beast who had barely managed to master the art of creating fire, let alone complex language or societal behaviors. This paradigm of us emerging for the first time from the last ice age, developing into the complex, advanced civilization we find ourselves in, means that Origins of Man is somewhat of a closed book. For to preserve this influential dominance within modern society, anything which contradicts this long-attested claim is simply thrown out, discarded as an anomaly, and any who pursue such avenues of inquiry a mere conspiracy theorist, this regardless of the evidence we so eagerly put forth in our defense. Countless, still existing, astonishing anomalies, unexplained, simply baffling feats of ancient engineering, so often covered here on our channel, either merely ignored or claimed as absent an explanation as to how, the work of our well-studied more recent ancestors, people who were simply incapable of completing such mammoth tasks. Many of these ancient ruins, claimed as more recent achievements, we feel, possess sufficient evidence to support far greater ages littering many said sites, 
clearly built using far more advanced precision technologies and Neolithic sites are of no exception. We believe here on the channel that the size of many of these highly eroded prehistoric stone trilithons, and indeed stones contained within many enormous dolmens, are also left by this ancient group. Dolmens made using similar, if not identical techniques throughout the world, from Scotland to Ireland to Japan, all of similar design and possessing inexplicable features, board entrances, multi-ton megaliths. It is as if this group still possessed the knowledge of how to lift and work such stones, but had lost the technologies used to carve with precision. It is as if they were a surviving remnant of a once more capable or more precisely better equipped civilization. How did this ancient people, academically claimed as never having had any contact, build such similar structures? Or perhaps more importantly, and the feature which initially attracted us to Neolithic ruins, the size of their stonework. Megaliths often incorporated into their structures, forming trilithons or entrance tunnels, with top slabs upon dolmens, sometimes up to 8 feet aloft, weighing well over 100 tons. Our discoveries at Newgrange in Dunor in Meath, Ireland, with a slab tunnel entrance, like so many Neolithic granges and barrows, regardless of their immense size, once precisely aligned them with solstices, yet they remain mostly buried and thus most conveniently concealed. Some argue that the most impressive Neolithic dwellings can be found dotting the Japanese landscape. However, we feel the most archaeological interesting of Neolithic sites dot the United Kingdom, France, and some areas of the US, yet particularly Scotland and Ireland sites which have fragments of ancient symbols left within, celestial alignments, and a similar pattern decoration or possibly coded message which crop up over and over, especially one found all over the world, of a strange enigmatic spiral. And although usually found sparsely decorating Neolithic sites, barrows, and internal earthworks, its reoccurrence so regularly must indicate it as once having been significant and important to them in some way. Yet for some reason, Gavernus is undoubtedly the most spectacular of them all. This little shared ruin displays this symbol significance in their carvings as seemingly fanatically overwhelming. Located in France, to have so many of these patterns clearly arranged in careful and concise manners by a people capable of aligning 100-plus ton rocks with pinpoint accuracy, we feel should be perceived as a very deliberate and important undertaking, perhaps in an attempt to convey a message to a future people, a people far removed from themselves in terms of language, a fact they may have fully understood, having, as we believe, experienced global cataclysm within living memory. So encoded messages, yet to be deciphered or even recognized as such, hidden within symbolism rather than writings. Are Gavernus's spirals mere decoration? If so, why go to such great efforts? Are these spirals an ancient code? Possibly a warning, a message yet to be unraveled. Whoever created Gavernus, and for whatever purpose, remains a mystery yet to be solved. Gavernus is a place very much still unexplained, yet very rarely shared academically. As such, it is a place we find highly compelling. Multiple sites nowadays are often, due to their immense age and their impossible characteristics yet to be explained, their size and precision, although clearly of an artificial as yet unexplainable nature. Alas, if it contradicts modern paradigm, is deliberately overlooked and mass, or when claimed as a permitted known world history group's work, is always absent methodological explanations as to how they achieve these feats. Academics controlled via financial and vocational security, ultimately becoming the arch enemy of a field that should be dynamic in nature, ever-changing, expanding, and accurate, a pioneering pursuit into the mysteries of history and indeed ourselves, in regards to true historical fact. A career of submissive deceit, many presumably went into the field with good intentions, yet 
quickly learned that they must tow the mainstream line if they were to survive, a theory that they all must know is fiction, they in unison defend and continue to push as conclusive fact. When the truth is, we have barely scratched the surface of the history of ourselves, or indeed the universe, the place we call home. The task of shipping the Lamassu would have shown the curators of London Museum, and indeed all involved and all interested in this undertaking, just what an incredible feat the transportation of these statues must have once been. For the museum chose a mere modest statue, and the arduous nine-month task, along with the custom-built ramps, would have shown them what we claim is clearly fact. They were fully aware of the unexplainable nature of the monuments and the mystery of how they transported them more than a century ago. So why all the secrets? Why hide our past? If we were introduced to the real mysteries currently hidden regarding life, it would inspire, free, and help so many people on their journey through life, as it enables us all to pursue a logical explanation in regards to where we all came from or indeed, why we are here. Many sites dot the Earth, which have either experienced cataclysm, sea salt halfway up the pyramid sides, inner chambers coated, marine shells found around the Sphinx's base, a mega metropolis recently rediscovered, abandoned, and reclaimed by the jungle of Guatemala, which once contained over 10 million civilians. Many other sites mostly quarries due to the unfinished processed stones that were underway, display abandonment of said work abruptly. Thus, not only is there evidence that can be found throughout the earth of past cataclysm and quarrying undertaking seemingly left, as if the culprits vanished, it is clear something happened. However, although if dated at more than the permitted chronology of man is denied as artificial, Regardless of the obvious fact they were man-built, this same field, geology, have, however, become unwitting, unpredicted ally to the channel's overall mission. In other areas of our investigations, their dating of water redistribution, for example, how rivers, seas, and ice radically changes location geographically over thousands of years, and due to this geology accurately dating when an area became submerged. The changing of the seas and the date in which these events occurred, with still flooded sites worldwide, a number of which we have so far covered. Bimini Road being one such anomaly, one of these artifacts that although submerged, thanks to academia's astute studies into the dates at which water levels changed, allows for dates far earlier than currently attested timelines of man can allow. Due to these dates, and the fact that they were clearly once built upon dry land, gives each ruin a minimum age far older than academia can ever admit to. Floodings dated by these same geologists, who were crucially, initially unaware of their existence, have dated many submerged ruins, including a number of pyramid complexes, at far over 10 to 20,000 years old with some floodings dated as occurring sometimes upwards of hundreds of thousands of years ago. For many of these sites, due to them not having been re-inhabited and left to the elements since their original abandonment, are clearly intelligently created ruins with clear artificial origins. Door cuts, right angles, even polygonal masonry, all denied as anything but geological by those who have even been there, yet again due to Gornia Shoria's immense size, sediment buildups, thus clearly prehistoric age, clearly proves any denial of artificial origin as an obvious conspiratorial lie. The fact that modern paradigm doesn't tell of any advanced civilization at this location within known history, thus no archaeological footprints left by a later people, relics which would have allowed academics to label said groups as undoubtedly the builders, and the undeniable evidence of prehistoric age, they must overlook such evidence. It must be overlooked or dismissed. The better at this you are, the more popular these institutions make you. If no civilization was ever recorded re-inhabiting an area at any time throughout permitted history, thus no archaeology, 
It is far too controversially old for academics to study. So the denial continues. Yet, ironically, the undeniable is the ultimate weapon. Slain by their own proverbial sword, the strategy of deceit is always succeeded by the truth. For the truth is grounded, unchanging, immovable, and founded upon a solid foundation. When such an occasion arises, the mere introduction of logical honesty, due to it being the truth, is far too fitting and in reflection of our regular expose of the lies littering modern teachings of history. The truth sticks. It resonates. Once the truth is exposed, it never dies. It is immortalized and unchanging. All we have ever wanted is for our viewers to ask themselves the questions we painstakingly search for the answers to ourselves, and we have dedicated a number of years of extremely hard work in amassing such a vast collection of stories, evidence, and other aspects supporting our work, regardless of MSM's reluctancy to ever promote, popularize, or pursue such subjects within their studies, papers, journals, or articles, those towing the line of illogical dating and explanations for origins must deny the obvious artificial nature it's one or the other. We find all of these things highly compelling. The Modern Day Institution Man's way of organizing belief systems into their different clans, cult-like attitudes, often driven by an existential perception, specialisms of some form or merely a naturally occurring passion. They are either built around a certain series of events or an apparent fact or claim, which stand as the cornerstones of said institution. It is therefore within the profiteers of said ideology's interests to not only suppress any evidence that may surface that would make their treasured institutions crumble to their very core foundation, but to actively destroy said relics whenever one gets an opportunity to do so. The Bamian Buddha, for example. Apparently this monstrous carving, perfectly bored into a sheer rock face in the Bamian Valley of central Afghanistan, is not only a relic, which we hypothesize, was left by a now lost civilization. But due to the facial features once masterfully depicted upon the statue, removed at some later time within history, carved flat, not only making its identification as Buddha questionable, it was for some reason completely destroyed during the Iraq War. Its destruction, I propose, supports our prior posit of it indeed being that of a lost civilization's work, this being the sole motive for such actions. Interestingly, hidden voids found behind the carving. If it were indeed a solid carving, as one would have once presumed when gazing upon it, how were these hollow chambers once placed behind said carving? Additionally, not only do most modern institutions deny any of the evidence we so often put forward on our channel, often in regards to a past lost civilization, but fields such as geology, is simply actively writing off countless ancient sites and anomalies as simply geological coincidences. Their existence being an impossibility according to already established, supposedly concluded chronology for human civilization. One reoccurring strategy, which I like to call the pareidolia effect denial, has befallen countless sites of interest. One of the most hotly debated, being the face on Mars, now simply dismissed as a trick of light, the intriguing pyramidal features nearby, which also somehow align with Pleiades. This denial strategy has condemned other said features here on Earth, some of which found in remote places that, according to modern academia, have simply never been inhabited. Thus, regardless of the artificial nature of such places as Gornia Shoria, must be dismissed as mere coincidental geological features. The ruins clearly immense age, often used, in an unfortunate twist of fate, as support of such claims, as nature eventually reclaims all, thus the older the ruin, the easier this said denial strategy is to argue. That is, until now, in a modern era, where modern technology now allows us to collect a massive amount of information on simply anything, unexplained features, parts and many other advanced, unexplained legacies of an antiquity, once hidden, 
now shared far and wide, evidence which flies in the face of modern paradigm. This Charonian is yet another of these curious, clearly immensely old anomalies that regardless of its form once being carved from extremely tough rock, maybe this is why our lost ancestors built with such enormous stones and did so in an as yet unexplained yet clearly highly advanced way known as polygonal masonry. Perhaps they built like this so that their footprint here on our planet be long-lived, designed to deliberately be resistant to the elements, to reach us now in the modern day, giving all of us an opportunity to understand the real history of our Earth, regardless of what others would like. We find all of these things highly compelling. Osaka Castle is one of the most intriguing of all of Japan's forgotten wonders. A place we have covered in the past, it was, we believe, like so many other inexplicable sites around the world, re-inhabited by our most recent of ancestors, placed within an academically permitted timeline of events. A chronology that, if one wishes to succeed in the mainstream, must toe the line of. For if one goes against the grain and explores the site with a critical mind, one can clearly see it contains a number of surviving features, which not only displays lost knowledge, thus the work of a lost civilization, which at some point in the very distant past built ruins all around the globe. Building countless polygonal ruins which have, due to their incredible construction technique, fortunately survived into the modern era. However, it is not just its polygonal foundations which show clear evidence of these elusive and consistently denied lost ancestors. Octopus rock, for example, also sometimes known as the drum stone, is the largest megalithic stone found within the walls within the castle's grounds. This giant stone, just like those of Baalbek, is enormous. Estimates for its weight range from 100 to 300 tons although it could, of course, be far heavier. However, even at these conservative estimates, any explanation of how ancient man accomplished such feats remains elusive. For the fact remains, the stone is of an incredible size, and to this day, its placement, along with many others found throughout the world, remains unexplained and unknown. So, for one to conclude that this stone's use its quarrying, transporting, and placement within this wall was done by our less capable, more primitive post-Ice Age ancestors. Yet all these methods of building and lifting, the knowledge of how to do such tasks, somehow simply vanished through the ages. All of which now remaining a mystery even with computer technology. An explanation still evades us. Thus to conclude this to be anything else than that of a relic, left by a far older, now lost civilization's work, we believe would be highly illogical and should appear illogical to anyone with a capacity to dissect the purposes for these actions, taken by an academia claiming to hold all the answers. All the while, actively concealing or ignoring any conflicting controversial evidence, truths that due to their belief in their power, laying within their reluctance to ever admit an incorrect hypothesis for the origins of species or the timeline of man. Thus, this doubling down on fallacy merely makes their persistence at sticking to said posits not only a damaging conspiracy, which robs us all of our heritage, but can also be perceived as an attempt to conceal anything which could alter the status quo. The octopus rock is an incredible feat of ancient engineering, and one, just like that of the polygonal masonry techniques that can be found at countless other sites the world over, is clearly a relic of a forgotten past, accomplished with the use of forgotten technology and knowledge. Just how big is octopus rock? How old is it for that matter? And how did our ancient ancestors accomplish these feats? As our research deepens and our studies widen, our target, that of a currently hidden lost civilization, becomes clearer in the mind every day, and it is only a matter of time before they are fully rediscovered. To deny such facts will eventually become too ludicrous. It is a journey of discovery which is, undoubtedly, 
highly compelling. When an ancient ruin is academically studied, it will often be attributed as the work of a far more recent, already studied, thus previously permitted group placed within known history, often a group simply incapable of such undertakings. Furthermore, not only do many sites hold evidence of a far older yet far more advanced builder having once been responsible for their construction, but such sites can often share characteristics with ancient ruins found far away, features from a said site also found on another continent on the other side of the globe. False doors, for example, found over countless ancient ruins spanning much of the world. This reoccurrence, along with many other similar signature features, are far from mere coincidence and can only be explained by a past intercontinental, highly capable lost civilization, as we have postulated in the past in regards to many factors indicative of their megalithic legacy. Metal clamps, identified on differing continents, varying in style and composition relative to what was presumably readily available, so although they differ in style, the knowledge of how to create and use such ancient technology had clearly been the work of the same civilization. The pyramids of Uymir, for example, are six rectangular pyramids you would more than likely have never heard of and most certainly would not have been taught of their existence by modern mainstream academia. Built from lava stone without the use of mortar, they are uncannily reminiscent of many structures within the South Americas. They are located in the districts of Chacona, part of the town of Uymir, on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Spain. The structures have been attempted to be dismissed as nothing but 19th century buildings, argued as the byproduct of contemporary agricultural techniques. Yet their infamous shape and the signature building techniques incorporated into said structures are undeniably found elsewhere on Earth. Other pyramids employing the same methods and materials of construction can be found in various sites on Tenerife. In Uymir itself, there were nine pyramids, any yet, regardless of academics attesting to them being no more than a century old, only six of the pyramids survive to this day. In 1990, adventurer and publisher Thor Heyerdahl became aware of the Canarian pyramids by reading an article written by Francisco Pedron in the Tenerife newspaper Dario de Avisos, detailing the quote, real pyramids of the Canaries. As Heyerdahl had hypothesized a transatlantic link between Egypt and Central America, which is a subtle way of saying a now lost yet once global superpower who once ruled the waves, he became intrigued by the Uymir pyramids and relocated to Tenerife. Heyerdahl hypothesized that the Canarian pyramids formed a temporal and geographical stopping point on voyages between ancient Egypt and the so-called Mayan civilization's ruins a claim we agree with, yet we posit that this contact was not between the Egyptians and Mayans, but was one and the same force, a far older, now lost, world-conquering civilization, an ingenious group who not only passed on their wisdom to every corner of the world, but even built in ways we are yet to understand. Unexplainable anomalies litter many ancient ruins to this day. Heyerdahl had predictably initiated a controversy with historians, esoterics, archaeologists, astronomers. Most of mainstream academia staunchly opposed such claims. By suggesting such an hypothesis, which flies in the face of already established paradigms, his research was predictably never pursued further than Heyerdahl personally took it. Yet I feel he succeeded in publishing a ruthlessly honest opinion in regards to the ruins, regardless of what was already apparently established as fact. And along with our research within Bosda Caves, and the similarities, differentiations, and other investigative strategies utilized to support such an argument of a now-lost world-going super-civilization, we feel the evidence for our case is now all but overwhelming. There are far too many connecting factors to simply claim coincidence, and as the proof of this past civilization's capabilities becomes more apparent and in turn researched, the closer we become to finally finding these now lost ancestors. 
it is a pursuit for the truth, which we find highly compelling.